I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, a booklet that was produced and released to the world in February 18th, uh, which provides a pathway to for Manitoba to uh, a resilient future, a carbon fuel free future. So um, this presentation is, is hopefully going to give you an idea of where it comes from and what it's all about. So it was produced by a number of people that contributed besides uh, the, the direct authors of the various chapters. Um, and then the lovely folks you see here, we've got um, subject matter experts that contributed to it. But the key uh, contributors are the organizations that, are, that make up the climate action team. So we've got the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Climate Change Connection, the organization that I work for, Green Action Centre, the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition, and the Wilderness Committee. So we had been working unofficially together for uh, quite some time, but then formalized our association with the Climate Action Team. And we initially uh, had a town hall that we organized at the University of Winnipeg to, uh, for community consultation related to the Climate and Green Plan. But then in 2018, this, uh, the, center, uh, the CCPA, uh, or sorry, the IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published this document here, Global Warming 1.5. And it spurred us to action. We needed to come up with a plan that would be consistent with what's in this document. And basically in that document, they talk about the why it's necessary to as much as possible keep the warming uh, certainly below two degrees and if possible 1.5 degrees because there's quite a bit of difference in, in, in consequences between those two. But in order to do that, we have to reduce our emissions very, very quickly and dramatically. And so we have to be at about half the emissions by 2030 and zero emissions, not net zero, but absolute zero by 2050. And so we got together and started thinking about how we can actually do that. And we came up with the road to resilience and hopefully you will find that it's an approachable document with a lot of ideas that provide some hope for, for moving forward. Uh, and and it even we even start with, with a, a couple of pages on imagining a resilient Manitoba. And okay, resilient. So what is resilient? Resilient in our inter interpretation in this particular case is our uh, meeting our ability or our ability to meet our basic needs ourselves without fossil fuels. Okay, meeting our basic needs. What are our basic needs? Well, primarily these three things. We have to be able to heat all of our buildings, old and new, without natural gas. We need to be able to move all goods and people without gasoline or diesel. And we need to be able to feed ourselves without fossil fuel fertilizers and without diesel for the machinery. That's in a nutshell, the challenge that we face. And we have got chapters in the Road to Resilience on each of those topics. We also have a fourth, we call these the technical chapters. We also have a chapter on energy and electricity, because in addressing those three challenges, we have to utilize our energy and electricity efficiently and effectively to meet those three challenges that I just spoke of. So we call in the document, you'll find four chapters, the technical chapters that deal with some pretty interesting ideas in all of those areas. And then we also ha have three foundational chapters. As we move forward with the technical solution, we can't forget about things like human impacts and, and, and climate injustices, generational economic and, and cultural injustices, health impacts of climate change, the economy and green jobs aspects, making the money work, finding and funding and, for, and, and uh, financing. And then beneath it all, or I should say above it all, is uh, making space for other living creatures besides ourselves. Uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also 
because of uh, the uh, requirement to store carbon in places like arboreal forest, uh, etc. So that's the structure of the, the road to resilience. And now for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to go through it at, at a high level. There's lots more information and detail in the document, but I'm going to hopefully give you a, an outline of what to expect in the document. And if you approach the document, there, Laura will have repeated the, the link in the, in the chat, hopefully, to get to it itself. But I'd recommend you do is read the intro chapter, and then you can go to the chapters that you find uh, compelling and interesting. Okay, so let's go through it at a high level. So first of all, I'm, this isn't in the order that you'll find it in the document, but I'm gonna talk specifically about energy and electricity. How do we utilize our energy and electricity effectively and efficiently to, to meet those other three technical challenges? And I'm bringing this forward early because this is really sort of a, a essential part of the problem or the challenge, okay? A lot of people think, well, we got lots of, we, we, a lot of people think that we've got too much hydroelectricity. We're exporting it and, and selling it too cheaply, which is probably the case. But <clears throat> if we start to really tackle climate change here, we're actually gonna need all that we have plus a lot more. And that's what this slide is all about here. If we were just to switch fuels, if we were just to take and, and go from where we are right now and suddenly uh, heat all of our buildings as they currently exist with the energy performance that they currently have. And if we were suddenly to convert all of the vehicles to electric, can hydro meet that requirement? Well, this, this, this uh, slide that you're seeing right here shows you, quantifies it. And this comes from the hydro's uh, load forecast report from 2018. Currently, in terms of energy, this is annual energy that hydro provides. They provide about 26,000 gigawatts every year. If all the buildings were suddenly just switched over to electric, we would have to have an additional 16,000 gigawatts. And if at the same time, all of the vehicles were electrified, we would need an additional 12,000. So put those together, that's an additional 28,000 gigawatts gigawatt hours, that's, a, that's energy, gigawatt hours per year. So more than double the amount that we have. Okay, that's pretty daunting. Okay, so that's energy. And you also have to understand that there's a difference between energy and power. Okay, energy is an integral over time. Power is instantaneous. So then this is actually the more challenging one, which is <clears throat> at some point, usually a cold January morning, if all of the buildings are electric, electrically heated, and all of our vehicles are electrically uh, motivated in mo motion, and they're charging at the same time, and you want to brew some coffee, and it's 30 below, how much power is required? Well, hydro can currently deliver about 6,000 gigawatts at a moment. If all the buildings are electric, they would require an additional 7,000 gigawatts. It says gigawatt hours, that's not correct, gigawatts. And an additional, if all the vehicles are electric, an additional 1,500, that's hydro's estimations, okay? So that means that we can't just switch fuels, although we need to switch fuels, okay? We gotta get away from fossil fuels to an alternative fuel, but it's not as simple as just replacing our furnaces with electric furnaces and replacing all of our vehicles with electric, okay? We also have to go through a, a doorway of efficiency, making our buildings more efficient and the way that we heat them more efficient. And we also have to look at energy storage. And there's come a few alternatives in my presentation. I'm just gonna talk about one of them, but there's others that are, we're gonna learn about more with SBM's, uh, a coming SBM uh, lunch and learn. All right, when it comes to buildings, there's two things that we're gonna to have to concern ourselves with. The envelope, the insulation and the, the vapor barrier around the building and the way that we heat it. Those two things both have to be addressed. So when it comes to the envelope, we're gonna to need to 
make it more efficient, make our buildings more efficient, require less energy in the first place. This photograph that you're seeing right here is the first certified passive house in Manitoba. So it was built uh, by uh, Sundial Building Performance and uh, uh, I've forgotten, oh, it was Bridgman that did the architecture and the energy modeling. So we have the, the, the capability here to do this. And uh, yesterday there was a presentation from Tanya Polson and the building trades, they're gonna be providing training for tradespeople in Passive House. So we've got some things on the horizon to move us in this direction. So that's for new residential and Passive House, by the way, even though it just says house, can be applied to all buildings. And then there's existing buildings. And there's um, a lot that can be done to the outside of the building this is an approach that, that Sun Certified Builders use. The Larson Truss is what you're seeing in this photograph. Um, and using plywood on the outside as the vapor and air barrier and some things. But this is an expensive proposition here, but really makes the buildings comfortable and reduces your energy requirement. So that's the envelope issue. The second thing to think about is the, this, the fuel switching and how do we heat the buildings? Well, first of all, this slide just identifies a problem, which is we're currently, we're making the pro problem worse every year by increasing the distribution of natural gas to more and more customers. On average, hydro is adding about 1% of the customer base every year. So that's a problem. And first and foremost, I think we gotta consider not making the problem bigger as a first step. But when we change to alternative fuels, there are a few options. One of them is biomass. Um, and But I don't recommend biomass in all cases, but in some locations where the fuel is close to where it would be consumed, let's take a look at it. Let's look at how, how that, that might work. And this is an example here of, of Providence College in Otterburn, which has installed a biomass system which primarily uses agricultural waste, straw, and sawdust from a nearby uh, furniture manufacturer. And they use it, they, what you see in the picture here is a boiler that heats up some water and glycol using the fuel from the hoppers. And then the water glycol is pumped around the campus and it heats up uh, the buildings on the campus. That's using Egg waste. Another potential is for uh, communities in the boreal forest, remote communities primarily, and Northern First Nations communities using wood. But in this case that you're seeing here, this is a, a really um, inspiring project in Dennis, Northlands Denish Luna First Nation in Lac Brochet, which uses burnt wood. Now they're not harvesting green wood from forest that is very slow growing and very close to the tree line. Instead, this is using wood that has been killed by forest fires, but not burnt all the way to the core. Those sticks that you see there are, have been harvested by local people from the community and in the wintertime brought across the lake to the log yard here. And that white building in the background is the, the biomass plant. And in the far background is the school that is heated by the heat from that, that plant. So what you've got here is a new source of employment as well as an alternative to trucking diesel fuel up on the precarious winter road net. So, and in both of those cases, in the Otterburn case and in the Northlands case, the, the heat that's generated in the heat plant is, is shared by a number of buildings in a district heating system. This is a really important technology and approach to taking an alternative fuel source and, and even an electrical fuel and making it more uh, useful, okay? This is where I'm, I'm leading with this is when, when uh, we call it, you know, geothermal is what we call it, but it's actually uh, a heat pump, a ground sourced heat pump. So using the latent heat of the ground for making electrical heating more efficient. and Right now we've been talking, or most of us talk about it, uh, doing the math about whether or not we can convert our homes. But what we're suggesting in the Road to Resilience is looking at it as more of, an, of a utility 
where a number of buildings in a neighborhood or a municipality in a community all share a central uh, ground source loop system, in this case under a playing field or, or elsewhere, and then shared amongst a number of buildings. So there are three heat pumps that I'm gonna talk about which make electrical heating more efficient. So we've got a ground source heat pump or geothermal. We've got water source heat pumps. Um, this, the coils that you see right here are part of a system that assists, again, it's in Northland's uh, Lac Brochet. It assists or is part of that whole system that uh, you saw the biomass uh, system in the biomass plant. They also have got a water source heat pump component to it. What you're seeing, what you see in this photograph are local people, six, uh, six out of the seven people in this photograph are local workers. They were trained and, and employed in their own community. And what, what they've done is taking these, these uh, plastic loops and take them out into the lake and then submerge them. As long as they're about 12 feet <clears throat> below the surface or four meters down below the surface, the, the hydrology says that, that ice will never get to that level you're always gonna have liquid water. And so they're gonna be able to draw heat from the lake. And it's been in operation for a couple of years now. And, and I can tell you that it works. I've been in the community and, and it it's keeps the buildings in the lakeside cluster warm. Um, again, uh, a bit of, of local employment as well as sustainable energy in that. And the third heat, so, uh, heat pump uh, is air source. The, this is a less expensive than those other two, however, uh, for initial installation. But the problem is that air source heat pumps will not provide additional heat or, or more efficient heat than resistive anything below about minus 15 degrees Celsius, even the most efficient ones. So it can help us with that energy requirement, but it won't help us with that power requirement. Okay, so uh, that's heating. Now, the last thing when it comes to buildings is some kind of energy storage where we can, can, if we've got additional energy production, we can save it up so that when we need it for that cold January morning, it's available. This is one of the potentials is a battery system at an industrial scale. Uh, this one was employed in, in Australia as an example. There's others we're gonna talk about hydrogen potentially. I don't know, I'm not convinced, but I'm, I've got open ears and an open mind because this is a problem that we're all gonna to have to work on. Okay, let's move to transportation now, the second out of the three uh, technical challenges. When it comes to transportation, probably the cheapest and the easiest uh, solution is to, to not travel at all. And we're getting a lot of experience these days with virtual travel and my, prediction is that that it the, the we're, we're learning about you know gather here and we're getting all kinds of new solutions coming up all the time and I think this is just going to get better and better so also I use a vehicle for shorter distances active transportation is not only good for the environment it's good for your health and as the infrastructure is more late is more extended that becomes more and more viable for more and more people more and more attractive and you don't necessarily have to own a car in order to get around. I don't own a car. <clears throat> I'm a member of Peg City Car Co-op. If I need a car, I book it online and I only pay for the distance and the time that I use it. Public transit is also necessary. We have a, a local manufacturer of buses, so there's some employment there. But in order for public transit to be really useful and effective, it needs to be frequent. And I have, I'm very happy to say that the, man, that the Winnipeg Transit Master Plan was released a couple of weeks ago, and it's very inspiring. I think it, it captures a lot of the, the, the necessary elements of making a public transit system much, much more attractive than what we've seen in the past. I'm super pumped about it, and the folks at Functional Transit Winnipeg are also excited about it. So, and as we roll out a better transit system, Making it electric is also part of the solution. And the, electric, the math when it comes to the economics of electrifying transit really are attractive. 
Um, and, and hopefully we'll have a presenter, uh, SBM will have a presenter talking about this uh, in the near future from transit. Uh, so electric buses, clean, quiet, and cheaper. Not necessarily to buy, but in the long run. But vehicles in general, electrification is a necessary part of the solution. And there's a, uh, the cost of production of electric vehicles is, uh, uh, the cost of production of gas vehicles internal combustion vehicles is going up by the cost of inflation. But the technology and the costs for electric, an equal range electric vehicle is falling exponentially. Those two curves are projected to cross in around 2023. So when you can buy an equal capacity, equal, equal range electric vehicle for the same cost as an internal combustion, you're gonna see that market that'll be a tipping point and it'll have profound impacts throughout the economy. And it's not just electric cars, but also um, trans, uh, transfer trucks. This is from uh, the, the uh, Tesla Semi. Other vehicles are also being experimented with in agriculture, for example. But there's also, again, back to that energy storage issue, the Tesla Powerwall gives an individual in their home the capability of providing the power that they need for heating or for their vehicles when it's maybe expensive to, to provide. And there may be some uh, time limitations on, on uh, the cost of, of electricity. And finally, when it comes to transportation, alternatives like airships for servicing the needs for remote Northern communities that are currently dependent on winter roads, which are becoming the, the length of time they're open is, is shorter and much more treacherous. So the last technical uh, chapter is food and agriculture. Very quickly gonna go through this. Talking about making food more local food, whether that's in your home garden or in a community garden, such as uh, has happened in, in Sustainable South Osborne. And the techniques used for production in the agricultural uh, uh, industry needs to work on, this This is really exciting, regenerative agriculture, which incorporates using ruminant animals, cows, for as part of the carbon cycle and nutrient cycle for uh, for grazing and, and changing the way that the animals are managed. You can't go at it with the, the same um, industrial approach that's been used so far. Some new uh, things like rotational storage, rotational grazing need to be employed. Uh, I'm still a vegetarian. I'm still learning about this, but having a, a smaller number of cattle involved in the solution is potentially uh, what, something we have to consider very seriously. And getting away from anhydrous ammonia as a, as, as a key fertilizer, we've, there are alternatives that are in the, the report. And it's basically a matter of, of managing the nutrient cycle, making sure that, that we don't treat organic waste as waste. Instead, we talk about ways that we can put it back into uh, the food system, whether it's at the household level, at the commercial level, and then back into the industrial uh, process more and more. The way that we grow food should come from as much as possible from uh, sources of, of nutrients that are, that are all part of a more holistic approach. So those are the four technical chapters. The three uh, foundational chapters are deal with human impacts. So we talk about the health impacts of climate, injustices of climate, typically, uh, unfortunately, the people who are most affected by, by climate change are not the ones that are, are the biggest contributors. And so we have a generational, cultural and an economic injustice to consider. And as we move forward to solution, we have got lots of opportunities when it comes to good, long-lasting, well-paying green jobs and, and, a, and an ultimately a healthy, healthy, more sustainable economy. Then again, underlying or above it all is a chapter on natural spaces and wilderness and ensuring that, that uh, we uh, take care of, of nature as we move forward with solutions. So that uh, is the, the, the thing in a nutshell, and it's not done, okay? We, we produced this, this pathway, okay? We, we call it a pathway, we don't call it a plan. 
And where we're headed in the next phase, now that it's been produced and, the, and it's, it's, it's available, uh, here it is, like we've got a, a few copies in paper, but mostly it's available as a PDF. It's a pathway that we wanna turn into a plan. So that's where I'm, and, and we, we need input for that. So what we're planning is a series of conversations, uh, sessions, maybe using uh, Gather. Uh, we're kind of toying with that idea for, for community consultation to move forward. So in a nutshell, if you're not tired of hearing me, there you go. I'm ready for questions. All right, so uh, we do have a question here around how did the authors engage with members of the public in developing the plan? Okay, good question. Well, we had actually we had plans to have four community engagement live in person community engagement sessions for each of the four technical chapters. We had them all planned out and we had we did have one at the University of Winnipeg in November of 2019. Um, where we did a food, we called it a future of feasting. We had a, a fall supper with eight workshops with subject matter experts teaching us things about dehydration and the importance of ruminants in soil health and stuff like that. Conversations were started. We took a lot of notes from all of that and we were going to do three more. We actually had planned the um, transportation one for March 11th and the pandemic was declared on March 9th, and so we canceled it. But we carried on with Zoom calls amongst subject matter experts that we had, had invited. So they're not necessarily named in the document, but their ideas were gathered. We've, we've got lots of emails from them. We've put them into files and stuff like that. And we're gonna continue and, and re-engage with them now that the, the whole document's been put forward into a series of, of uh, conversations going forward. That's what we're hoping to do. Yeah, excellent. Sorry, just correction of dates there it was actually March 13th of the transportation event, right, as lockdown was coming. Sorry to uh, say that. Uh, okay, I don't have any other questions if, unless there's somebody who wants to come off mute and uh, share what they have to say. Be bold, get your questions answered. Oh, Ken, is that you who are? Oh, I see a few people who came off mute. Ken and Daniel, I see you there. Yeah, uh, it's Ken here, Kurt. So uh, okay. today the Supreme Court of Canada issued its ruling on the constitutionality of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, and it found six to three that the federal carbon pricing system is constitutional. And it's, it's a landmark case clearly has, will significantly impact Canadian climate policy in the years to come. So uh, Manitoba's premier has vowed to continue to fight. Um, how, how do we get him to abandon that, that futile struggle given the Supreme Court ruling? Yeah, I was very disappointed to hear. Well, I was, I was really happy to hear about the ruling, first of all. And then an hour or so later, I, uh, this comment from the premier. And I, I was really questioning um, what, what the, the logic was, and, and I, I understand that he's making a, he's saying that we've got elect high, a clean electricity and therefore we should get a break. Well, <clears throat> there's, there's a few things that, to unpack here. First of all, okay, the need for carbon pricing, putting a, a more reasonable price, a more a fairer price on carbon pollution, capturing some of those externalities, external costs. So putting, it's, this is a necessary, uh, mechanism for solution. We need to be able to have revenue. A lot of those things that, that we're talking about are going to be expensive. So we need revenue. It makes sense to have the revenue a source, or at least one of the sources being where the problem comes from in the first place. And, and then we have to make use of that revenue stream to help us for programs that help us get away from those costs. So in, in the road to resilience, there's a key one that we recommend. We recommend that adopting or uh, accepting the carbon price, keeping the, the revenue here in Manitoba. And we suggest 20 to 30% should be sent back to households that are unfairly or that aren't really uh, economically capable of, of handling the cost. So they shouldn't have to, to choose between being warm and being fed. 
Okay. So 20 to 30 percent, but we we suggest that the addition that the remainder go to Efficiency Manitoba, and that Efficiency Manitoba's legislation be changed so that it directs them instead of the 1.1.5 and 0.75 targets, they're instead focused on targets that result in greenhouse gas emission reduction through the efficient use of our electricity. So that's what Remec we recommend. Uh, Kurt, sort of a follow-up question. We, we heard Efficiency Manitoba provide their first annual uh, public meeting earlier this week, and they basically acknowledge that the $32.3 million in federal climate funding that they are going to be receiving, not one penny of it is going to be used to expand any of the programs that were approved in their application to the PUB, and presumably all of that money is going to go to reduce the amount of money from Manitoba Hydro that's contributing to efficiency Manitoba. Um, are you concerned about that? Yeah, it's, I mean, we should be putting all available resources into this solution rather than using Peter to pay Paul. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, um, I've got uh, concerns about that. Uh, instead, we should be hammer and tongs working on this problem. So thanks for your questions, Ken. Yeah. I think uh, we agree that there's some changes that should be made. Thank you. Um, I feel like this conversation could continue for a lot longer, which is why we've got gather.town as the space that we're headed to. I just added that information into the chat, uh, catch the password, which is resilience. And um, this is exactly the sort of thing that we want to talk about at uh, 4.30 in our community conversation. How do we work to make sure that Manitoba is built sustainably? So uh, please do join us for that. It, uh, it'll be worth your time. And I'm just gonna I, jump in there's, real quick. A, there's some questions. I, I will be in the gather. So if you want to grab me in the gather, I'll, I can answer, talk to you about it. Go ahead, Dan. I just wanted to Dan. quickly uh, recognize Kurt and Laura and team for their exceptional work in creating this. Uh, bravo, lots of claps. Um, seriously, it, it provides us, I think, with the basis upon which um, all of our new policy initiatives, suggestions, et cetera, green groups can build uh, from, and it provides a great basis for that. So bravo, good job, great, great uh, foundation.